On today's World Insight, we hear from a spectrum of voices in America concerning the China-U.S. trade war. And we don't want to turn this into a cold war, okay? The United States will go to great lengths to prevent China from being an equal. And with the phase one trade deal imminent, we uncover if more trade deals are on the horizon. And here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight on CGTN. I'm Tian Wei. The trade war between China and the United States eased a little at the end of last year when the two countries announced that they had reached a phase one agreement. It seems that both sides tried hard to avoid the worst case scenario. Now the question is how to achieve the desired result. This is what many global thinkers are contemplating. Today in our show, we have a series of talks with them. First, Thomas Friedman a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner and one of the most esteemed journalists in the world. He strikes a positive tone describing China-U.S. trade relations as quote-unquote one country, two systems, depicting the deep links of the world's two largest economies. In an exclusive interview with me earlier, he explained it all. People are very curious as to why at this moment when others sound so pessimistic, you wanted to have a rather encouraging tone about the bilateral relations. I believe America and China are also one country, two systems. You know, <laughs> um, that are we're, we're one country in the sense that our fates are really tied together. America cannot rise, I don't believe, without a healthy relationship with China, and China cannot rise without a healthy relationship with America. And we've got to find a way for our two systems to maintain this healthy interdependence. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there's any big problem in the world, climate change, uh, cybercrime, nuclear proliferation, that can be effectively dealt with um, if China and America are not working together. And I don't think there's any problem in the world that can't be fixed if China and America are working together, mm -hmm. no matter how big. There is one big uncertain factor, that is the factor of leadership um, and what the one sitting in the office consider as the quality of leadership. Right. So when the president has been saying from the very beginning this will be more about a transition rather than a more sophisticated bilateral relation agenda setting. Right. Uh, do you think that might happen? Right. I, I think we're at a very critical moment. Let me tell you how I see this, Jen. One is that, um, so we, America and China, have a very unique relationship. We are economic rivals and economic partners. We are technological rivals and technological partners. We are geopolitical rivals and geopolitical partners. Without U.S.-China cooperation, there would have been no Paris Climate Agreement. Okay. So we have a very unusual relationship. Now, there are people in America um, who see China as the new Soviet Union. Uh, they think it's just another communist country, you know, that wants to take us, oh, to take over the world, okay? That is not how I see it. I think we have a very unique relationship with, with China, and we don't want to turn this into a Cold War, okay? China, remember, with Russia, the only thing Americans bought from Russia mm -hmm. was vodka, mm -hmm. caviar, and nesting dolls. Mm -hmm. With China, we are, we are completely inter, interdependent, okay? So to me, the question is really three things. Um, there's the bilateral trade issue, there's the Huawei issue, mm -hmm. and there is global geopolitics. And unfortunately, uh, my administration has not clearly delineated uh, each one of those, and so they kind of blend together mm -hmm. um, at the same time. There's confusion in Washington to exactly what is President Xi Jinping's bottom line. Mm. Uh, does he want to retain all the advantages China got early on in the WT negotiations? Is he ready to compromise? Mm. Is he ready to put it into legal language? There's a new Foreign uh, Trade Investment Act now being written here. So I think both sides, we need a timeout. Mm. Step back, okay, let's lower the temperature yeah. and let's go for some confidence building measures where we say uh, we can prove to China we're not out to make you into an enemy, mm -hmm. to permanently tariff you, and President Xi can prove to, the, to President Trump that I'm actually ready to do changes, yeah. but I need to do them my own way. Yeah. 
Right. And in Chinese context. Some suggest it's already in the process of yeah. decoupling. Well, that's Are what I'm fighting about that? I'm, I'm deeply, deeply worried about it. Because we have our hardliners, you have your hardliners, we, both sides have people who think the worst of the other, and I am the enemy of those people. I, 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 think this, I think we are one country, two systems, and the world is better for that. When a correspondent being parachuted into right. a country. Absolutely. There are very, there's very few references yes. that he or she can refer yeah. to in terms of how to judge, how to have a round of references, yes. and how to eventually put things into perspective yes. for the readers at home, particularly when you have another editor right. at home Absolutely. trying to make it ever right. more dramatic exactly. given the pressure of right. social media recently. So it's a process, and yet I'm afraid mm -hmm we are in a very critical time to still do this learning curve. Yes, yes. So this is a lot of things all at the same time, yes, yes. as you illustrated well. Yes. Technology, yes. Uh, the way people want to create their own image and thinking, and yes. the politics yes. and the geopolitical change. Yes. So how do you see these entangled uncertainties? Well, you know, it puts a premium, therefore, on being serious as a reporter. I've been coming to China. Uh, since 1989. Um, so I've come, all, I, I believe, every year since 1989. So I've been able to travel all over the country. I do not, unfortunately, speak Chinese, but I've spent a lot of time here trying to learn, you know, the country. And so over time, um, you, you develop what I call some depth perception. You know, I mean, not just surface, but some depth perception. That is the most important, right. most treasurable yeah. atmosphere. And, and the, most, the other thing you develop are people you trust. So you're one of the people I trust. So if I don't really, and so if I come, I have a story idea, I can say, you know, Tian, I mean, you know, am I on the right track here? You know what I mean? But if I'm just parachuted in here, I have no one I trust. I may come with biases or misperceptions. Uh, you're you're going to get that problem. Mm -hmm. But it, it can be true for Chinese reporters coming to America too. You know what I mean? Um, I see, you know, Chinese reporters there often. And, and um, uh, you know, to me, um, it's always about good and bad journalism. Mm. And you can do it in Chinese, you can do it in English, you can do it from Beijing, you can do it from Washington. And you're always going to have both. When you have newspapers or websites of news that are becoming ever more partisan, right. Tom, I know you face a situation just like that, yes. particularly with the election, ever sure. more closer. So how are you still going to be able to, relatively standing as neutral, and be able to give your views? I mean, after all, you're working for the New York Times, which has been portrayed by Donald Trump, at least, as the quote-unquote fake news. Right. One could tell from this comment the relationship between New York Times and uh, your president. So what about that? So it's a moment where you really have to keep your head as a journalist. The president's attacked I me personally. I love that. Keep yeah. your head. Keep your head. Keep your head on your shoulder. You know, the president's attacked me personally on Twitter. Uh, I responded, but I responded in a respectful way. Okay. Um, but you've got to keep your head in, in a couple of ways. How come you're responding in a respectful way? If you are not responding in a respectful way, maybe in the way that your president did, you're going to be hot, probably yes. even hotter than today. Yes. Tom, why I you did. didn't? I, I respond in a respectful way because um, I'm not just responding to him. I'm responding to his supporters. And when they see me respond, defend myself, but respecting him, they will respect and listen to my message more. Um, you know, uh, I recently changed my business card, Jim. Mm. It used to say Thomas L. Friedman, New York Times foreign affairs columnist. Mm. It now says Thomas L. Friedman, New York Times dignity and humiliation correspondent. <laughs> okay? I love that. Because I have learned over my 40 years as a journalist that the two most powerful human emotions are dignity and humiliation. If I humiliate you, you will never listen. But if I respect you, it's amazing what you'll allow me to say to you. And so that's a, uh, really a, a tenant of mine. Now, you know, with, with, um, with, with the media, we always have to remember that we are not the story. Okay, the story is the story. I'll tell you a story about the New York Times. That's not easy to Yeah, say. no, exactly. Everybody so wants to be, be the story. The story. So in 1982, before you were born, I was the New York Times correspondent in Beirut in the Lebanon uh, Civil War and Israeli invasion. And my apartment was blown up 
in June 1982, and my driver's wife and two daughters were killed in my apartment. One of the worst days of my life. One could imagine the anger yeah, you have. A, and the New York Times did not let me write about it. My apartment was blown up. They said, you're not the story. Look at all the other people whose buildings you know, and homes have been destroyed. You're not the story. We eventually wrote a little box because other people wrote about it. But that's the ethic. That's the news I was raised in. Today, too many reporters want to be the story. So if I'm, uh, if I'm covering the White House, I should not be tweeting about the White House, my opinion. Uh, if I'm, you know, and, and the same on China. You can, you, know, you can cover China as a story, but don't be tweeting about it. The same for Chinese covering America, okay? The need to separate your opinion from the news is more important than ever. Um, but you also have to keep your head because it's so noisy out there. Yeah. So why am I in Beijing? First, I get the honor of speaking for the, you know, the CDF, but also um, I'm a big believer if you don't go, you don't know. If you don't go, you don't know. And not coming here doesn't mean I know, but it does reduce the chances that I get it wrong. And so I go around, I talk to as many people as I can, and I try to you know, balance out what I hear to see the signal through the noise. It's always about, for me, what's the signal? What's the, what's the story here? And that's the, the real trend. The real trend. Because just the and it's so important today, Tim, because it's so noisy there. And so that's why I'm actually not on Twitter. The New York Times tweets my column. I occasionally tweet something, but I, I have never looked at Twitter. I don't know what Twitter looks like. I'm not on Facebook. I don't know what Facebook looks like. Um, and I've never smoked a cigarette. And I plan to die saying all three of those things, okay? So, um, and the reason is it's too noisy. And if, I'm, and, and if I'm always looking, what are they saying about me on Twitter, Sino Evo, whatever, yeah. then I'm not focused on the signal. I'm focused on me, and I'm not the story. It's about the story vis-a-vis -vis the eagerness exactly. of the reporter exactly. or and of the host of, or, the, or exactly, of whatever. whoever. Exactly. And the New York Times, CCTV, exists for one reason, to serve the viewers and to serve the readers, not to serve you, not to serve me. Where do you think we're going from here? I mean, I know now. Tom, many of our friends mm -hmm. have quit. Right, yeah, no, there's no question. Really experienced, yeah. great journalists. Yeah. Of my generation and, and yours, you know, are, yeah, there's no question. I'm so happy I had my career when I had it, you know, number one. But I have a daughter who is the executive producer of All Things Considered. I uh, love week, that weekend show. edition. Say hi to her? I will do that. I talked to her this morning on NPR, and so I, I have a, it's a family business, and so I, I see, you know, the issues she has to contend with. But at the end of the day, Tim, you know, whether my daughter's working for radio, whether she's 30 years younger than I am, I still believe this, is that good journalism that's produced by good reporting and good analysis still wins, still sells. It doesn't matter if it's on the web, on Sina Weibo, on Twitter, on Chinese TV or the New York Times. And that's what, that's what I always focus on. My, my view is if you build a diamond hard reality, around your journalism, based on good reporting and good analysis, no amount of criticism will stick. And if you don't, no amount of tweeting will save you. So you might as well focus on building the diamond hard reality. It doesn't mean I get it right all the time, but I feel if you come out, if you struggle with it, if you find trusted colleagues yeah. where I can come and say, Tian, is this, is this really this or that? You know, as you have in my office in Washington, you know, um, the, you'll get more things right than wrong. And if you're, if you're doing that, you're, you're, you're doing your job. Welcome back. Looking back at last year, the trade war between China and the U.S. dragged on and tariffs have been levied on billions of dollars worth of each other's goods. Uncertainty over when the conflict might be resolved has rattled the markets and the global supply chain. Despite a positive momentum led by the landmark Phase One Agreement, there are still American scholars who view relations as zero-sum game. One of them is John Mearsheimer, a professor of political science from the University of Chicago. Earlier, we had an insightful discussion, if not debate, on some of the key issues around China-U.S. relations. Let's listen in. Do you think uh, the president that you have right now is serving exactly the purpose that you argued in your theory? My argument was that the United States has to be mainly concerned with China as a military threat, as a security threat, mm -hmm. and that the United States would engage in containment, much like it did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. 
But in this case, right, I think with President Trump, it's largely, if not almost completely economic. Mm -hmm. He's a businessman. He likes to do deals. And his basic view is that the Chinese have been beating the Americans economically. Is it healthy to have one aspect of the relationship be the dominating voice of the overall nature of this relationship. Now, many argue both here in Beijing and in Washington that national security has become the top priority about everything. I think that's just the way the world works. I think that any time you have a country like the United States, that is the most powerful country in the world, and a country like China comes along and it begins to rise, and it looks like it might be able someday to challenge the United States. It might become as powerful as the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States will go to great lengths to prevent China from being an equal. What you have said, uh, Professor Mearsheimer, and the debate you have created uh, as a result of the theory is a thought-provoking one because people really need to think about these questions profoundly and need to search for evidence and also think about what kind of solutions if they want to avoid the worst outcome yes. um, in the future. But on the other hand, uh, Professor, I have to also inform you that some been trying to take advantage of your theory or theories similar to that of yours in, shall we say, in both cultures, trying to stimulate further conflicts and escalate it even to an extent that the current stage actually do not necessarily has to see. What do you make of that? I think that there's no question that there are going to be some people who believe what I have to say. That's going to influence their thinking and therefore they are going to go out and push either the United States or China to behave in ways that I advocate. It's getting worse as a result. Yes, but my argument is that it's not because of my rhetoric. It's because of the structure of the international system. If I didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I keep on asking this very similar question to you, Professor Mearsheimer. That is, why do you think people have to stand in line to say to themselves, now security is the priority? Why do you think there shouldn't be an opportunity for people to think maybe more interactions between the two countries is the top priority. Why do you think interactions will not necessarily lead to solutions, but rather decoupling and getting ever worse situation between two countries will lead us to the solutions? That just is not very rational to me. No, I actually believe it's very rational. I think it's a very depressing story. And I think that's what bothers you about my story. It is so depressing. I'm not bothered. I'm rather seeing it's very partial that you only focus on one area, the security area, which you are very familiar with, forgetting about the other areas, which is equally important. For example, uh, trade, which has brought China to a very different development stage. I'm not sure whether your experiences have been feeding you to one aspect of the argument without necessarily having enough insights on the other sides of the argument. Well, I fully understand that all of this economic intercourse over the past 30 or so years between China and the United States has had very positive consequences for both the United States and for China. I fully understand that. But the problem is that as a result of all of this economic intercourse, China is growing increasingly powerful and it's closing the power gap with the United States. Why is it a problem? For one very simple reason, it involves security. And what I think you don't understand is that security or survival has to be the principal goal of any country. Any Chinese leader or American leader has to be mainly concerned... Is there common security? No. Is there only security for one without the others? Yes, my point to you is that as China gets more powerful, it becomes a zero-sum game. Why would it become a zero-sum game? Only you are saying it's a zero-sum game. 
You're no. exactly advocating a zero-sum game, no. while China has been saying it is not. We hope it is not, and we're trying to do in a way that it's not. Of but course, now, of everything wants to be cut off. You cut off trade, you decouple, of course it's going to the direction that you have already planned. You here, I do not necessarily refer to you yourself, but rather who try to cut the relationship in one direction without giving other options and possibility. The point is that economic growth can be translated into military power. It can, but it does not necessarily lead to war or even regional conflict. That is the point. Again, I don't know what I can do to convince you. Uh, You're not convincing I, me, Professor. No, I understand that. And, uh, but all I would say to you is you have watched U.S.-China relations deteriorate since 2011 mm -hmm. when Hillary Clinton announced the pivot to Asia. Why did you get a pivot to Asia in 2011 and not in 2001 and not in 1991? You got a pivot to Asia in 2011 because the United States was beginning to get really scared about Chinese economic growth. Well, Professor, I'm afraid you are using the result to describe the reason of the issue. You got a pivot to Asia as a result of some fear in the United States about China. I'm yes. not sure that fear is necessarily coming from the business community. I'm not sure that fear is really necessarily coming from students that are uh, in Chinese university from the United States, for example, that are studying here. It is coming from politicians. This is exactly what we're talking about. Politicians are defining the relationship with use of geopolitics. That may be true, but politicians run countries. And if politicians define the relationship... There have been a lot of failed leadership in our history, and those failed leadership have been thrown away by history. See, I think that real leadership or high-quality leadership uh, means recognizing the importance of the balance of power. As devastating, some would say, that your theory is, there are still things that both sides can do to manage the relationship, to make sure it's not sliding down the slope that you described. Anything to do? I do believe, as I've said on numerous occasions here, that I believe there will be an intense security competition, but there will not necessarily be a shooting war. I think what we have to do, both the Chinese side and the American side, is over the course of this competition, go to great lengths to manage it. How? So that, well, we have to think about clearly what one state does that will provoke another state and avoid doing that. And if we get into, the crisis, into a crisis, we have to have clear rules about how to communicate with each other and do everything possible to dampen down the conflict and prevent it from escalating. But since security is the priority, you already see some of the people that need to urgently talk to one another from both sides are not talking anymore. That is the danger of decoupling, no communication, talking across each other rather than real communication. But I think the key issue here is that, as I've said on a number of occasions, survival is the principal goal of each state. And you want to understand that when you talk about the United States and China, you're talking about two countries with nuclear weapons. And if a crisis turns into a war, there's always a danger that that will escalate into a nuclear war. And the survival of each of those states could be threatened. Mm -hmm. So we have a deep-seated interest in managing a crisis to prevent a war from breaking out mm -hmm. and certainly to prevent that war from escalating. And I think what has to be done always in the early stages of a competition is that rules of the road have to be established. Understandings have to be established. That has not happened yet. And that's why one could argue, as was the case in the Cold War, the early stages of a competition between the United States and China will be the most dangerous because there are not clear roles, rules of the road. They haven't been worked out But yet. the rules of the world now is being questioned with the United States going unilateralism and also trying to withdraw as many, as many international organizations and treaties as possible in this administration. So how could you have what you have just said, the rules 
and the common rules and the respect for the common rules, not to mention the rules really need to be updated and in many new fields as well. But there's nothing about that. It's all about decoupling thanks to your theory that the two countries are going to be competitors in a very hostile way. Well, I don't think it's thanks to my theory. It's thanks to the fact that the world is changing. You want to remember that during the Cold War... So how about the rules? Where to set the rules? Where to set the rules? And how to establish the rules? Well, the United States and China will uh, maneuver with each other, and they will establish rules of the road as to what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. <laughs>
the headline every day likely to be discussed at all? Well, um, Trump is a very unusual president. If he wants to do something, he can do it in spite of strong opposition. So we have already seen that on many occasions. But rather his own incentive to do it. Right. I think at the moment he is under big pressure from the uh, technology industry because U.S. high-tech industry views China as a major market. So if Trump continues the policy on the control of technology transfer, that will be a big loss for the high-tech industry. So if Trump decides to move ahead with this issue, he will get strong support from the high-tech Silicon Valley. Is it going to help him with, with the votes? Certainly he will get more funding for his campaign. Interesting. Mm. Another thing, of course, is the impeachment process, shall we say, yes. going on right now, zigzagging, very dramatic, day-to-day -day new development. Now, as we all know, it is a political tool to a certain extent with one party toward the other candidate. So what do you make of complicated internal factors like this in terms of their impact on politicians' determination and willingness to discuss further and seriously? Well, I think for uh, Trump, he needs to show his contribution to U.S. economy by negotiating or renegotiating new agreements with China, which uh, helps the U.S. not only to reduce the tr trade imbalance, but also encourage uh, U.S. exports to China as well as forcing China to make concessions on IP protection and other areas. So China in the election year will be a useful instrument for Trump to show both to his opponents and also to his supporters that he can make a new deal with China for the sake of U.S. national interest. But the question really is, does China want to be that quote-unquote instrument using your word? Well, um, I think relations between countries are always reciprocal. If the U.S. is willing to address some of the Chinese concerns that I have already brought about, like Huawei, like technology transfer, like Chinese investment in the United States, why not? So that is the nature of business. In the recent conversation between the Chinese and the U.S. president, the Chinese side did express dissatisfaction about some of the words and actions coming from the U.S. on issues regarding Hong Kong, regarding Taiwan, regarding Tibet, and regarding Xinjiang. So what do you make of the next stage of bilateral interactions? Well, I think this relationship will remain to be turbulent in the next year. However, um, there may be some difference uh, next year. This year, this relationship has been mainly overshadowed by the trade issue. So in spite of uh, Taiwan, uh, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong, uh, I think for the U.S., the major concern remains the uh, trade issue, economic dimension. Next year, I think after the signing of the Phase One Agreement, um, and as we start to negotiate the Phase Two, I think the U.S. side may try to play uh, Taiwan card more forcefully than this year, especially if Tsai Ing-wen gets re-elected in Taiwan. That will further uh, aggravate the Chinese concern on this issue. And my concern is that next year, the big problem in this relationship will not necessarily be the trade issue, but the Taiwan issue. Mm. Is there any way that the Chinese side will be leveraging this, this uh, danger and be able to uh, make sure it's not going to be interfered, its internal affairs? Well, um, I think then China has to show the willingness to use some of the leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States, especially in phase two negotiation. If the U.S. doesn't address the Chinese legitimate concern on the Taiwan issue, then we may, be, we may not be willing to move forward on this negotiation, as the U.S. Would, would like to say. And also remember, I think the reason for Trump to initiate the phone call to President Xi 
my speculation maybe is about the North Korean issue. So at this moment, the U.S. wants to get the Chinese coordination and cooperation on the North Korean issue. Now, Professor, there is advantage and disadvantage for anyone to link trade issues with political issues and with geopolitical issues as well, mm -hmm. nuclear safety also. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the pros and cons if linking them together? Uh, at the policy level, um, the linkage is everywhere. Even though you do not care exactly, clearly that there is a linkage, but we know, they know there is a linkage in, in this relationship. So that is why, as we have seen in this year and before, the U.S. has played many political and geopolitical cards vis-a-vis -vis China to push China on the trade and economic issues. This has been the case all the time. Do you think it's decent? Well, I, I wouldn't say this is, a, this is not a moral issue. This is an a, a issue of uh, policy. So for policy practitioner, this is the way, this is how business is conducted. So it's not a moral issue. For you, who have been working on China-U.S. relations for decades, and very outspoken about it also, what do you make of the U.S. recent actions and words, if I could quote from the Chinese president, uh, toward the issue of Hong Kong and the issue of Xinjiang? Which direction do you think Washington is heading for? My um, speculation is that um, there are mainly two motives behind this. One is uh, political and ideological. Um, some people, they push these issues really because they dislike the China's uh, political system, ideology, value, all these kind of things. So I think they want to, 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 to uh, give China a hard time on this issue. But for some other people, these issues are just instrumental. They want to play Hong Kong and Xinjiang as cars to pressure China on economic issue. So I think they are divided. What do you think next year when these issues, some of the issues might be coming down compared to earlier. Mm -hmm. However, some of the issues might be further uh, manipulated by some parties. Uh, what do you think will be the best approach China could have? Well, um, the, I mean, when the U.S. enters campaign season, uh, people will become uh, too excited. So China will be uh, a major factor in the uh, presidential election and will be a hot topic for the presidential uh, debate, to be sure. I think for China, uh, what's important is that we need to try to stabilize this relationship by managing well the overall economic relationship. And for other issues like Taiwan, and Hong Kong and Xinjiang, I think the uh, friction will continue. But overall, I don't think they, w they will really challenge the overall framework of this relationship. Why not? Because, I mean, look at Hong Kong. The U.S. cannot take Hong Kong away. Right, Hong Kong is part of China anyway. You don't have to worry about it. For Taiwan, does the U is the U.S. ready to really support for Taiwan's independence? That doesn't mean, that means... At any cost? At any cost? I don't think so, especially for President Trump. That economically doesn't make sense for him, right? Xinjiang, I mean, that's part of China. You may not like Ch some of China's policy in Xinjiang, but you cannot make a big difference there. So these issues will be points of concern for China, but they don't really make a big difference in this relationship. If we can stabilize economic relationship, which is a core concern for President Trump, and also win over the support of the U.S. business community for this relationship, I think it should be okay, in spite of continued turbulence. Mm. Finally, before we go, Professor Wu, what do you think the other side, the U.S. side, should bear in mind when they are dealing with China today? Well, um, I think the biggest challenge is that the U.S. should be careful not to try to put China as another enemy of the United States. My concern is that some people are trying to make China 
the next major enemy for the U.S. and use this as a political leverage to mobilize the U.S. society. If the U.S. society comes to an agreement on this issue, that will be disaster for the U.S. foreign policy, especially for its China policy, because China is not America's enemy, and, and we are not America's enemy. So if the U.S. makes its policy on this assumption, that will be a big strategic mistake. Professor Wu, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN. And also check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of my team of World Inside, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for more insights.